move from the uh, item five, which is the election of chairman and vice chair and start that at the beginning. So uh, as the first, first item of business, I propose the election of the chair of the working group for this meeting and for the reminder, remainder of the financial, sorry, municipal year. Um, and in that respect, may we have nominations as chair? Tony, I'd like to propose you as chair. I'd like to second. Thank you, Jackie. Any other nominations? Okay. Um, in that case, I... Do we need to take it to vote, Kath? Yes. In that case, could you please vote for nomination of myself as chair? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and then I propose the election of the vice chair of the working group for this meeting for the remainder of the financial municipal year, which runs until May, just so we're aware. Um, any nominations as vice chair, please? Currently it's Donna. I nominate Donna then. Okay. Any other, nom any seconds? I'll second. Thank you, Jackie. Any other nominations? In that case, I want Donna as vice chair. Thank you very much, everybody. I will now move to the agenda proper. Tony, uh, I think we need to just take a vote on that. Uh, sorry, can we have a vote on Donna being the uh, vice chair, please? Okay. Rebecca's just joined us. Welcome, Rebecca. We're going on then to apologies for absence. Um, I'm pretty certain Patrick is joining us, but currently he's not present. So can we just... I, I am. I see Sorry, Patrick, I didn't, couldn't see you. Okay, so we're all in. That's right. Uh, are there any declarations of interest related to the business to be transacted, transacted at this meeting? Any declarations of interest? No, in that case, we'll proceed. Um, may we move to approving the minutes of the last uh, working group meeting, which you held on the 8th September. You have received this as part of your agenda. Um, first of all, are there any comments on it in the first instance? Okay. In that case, can we move to approve them, please? Can I have a vote in that respect? Right. Um, and then public participation. Tony, I've, got, I've got a minor comment. It talks about the Green Deal, but I think you mean the Green Homes Grant. Correct. And it is, yeah, and because they're two quite different things, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. That's yes. all. Green Deal is no longer in place. It's not the green Thank deal. you, Claudia. I'll make that correction. Okay. So the minutes have been approved. Um, now I'm asking for public participation. Um, is there anyone in the public that would like to make a question or receive a comment? Um, I can't see who's in the public participation, so could... Uh, Kath, could you identify if that's the case, please? We haven't got any members of the public other than members of the committee, just members of the committee. Okay, all right, so we'll proceed then. Um, so we then go to uh, existing projects updates, item number six on the agenda. Um, and first of all, on retrofit, could Kath, uh, could, uh, could Rebecca and Claudia and Patrick, if it's appropriate, talk about the work they've been doing on that recently? Um, Claudia, do you want to start or shall I start? You start, you start I'll chip in. Okay. Um, so, in so in terms of retrofit, um, we've been years, we had a very good visit to Tony Cowley, um, who lives in Reading, in the outskirts of Reading. He's a builder and he's built a house that um, is virtually zero carbon. Um, it's really rather inspiring. He's himself quite an advocate for it. Um, he's also got very close links with Reading Council as well. Um, so it was very interesting and I think we learned a lot going to see his house. 
um, as to the sorts of things that could be done um, here. Um, I've also discovered that there is in Kingston Bagpuis, there is a builder that has built nine zero carbon houses. Um, it's a place called Springfield Meadow. We've been trying very hard to get in contact with them because I think that um, the more examples we can find of these types of houses, uh, the stronger it will be for us to be able to make a case for, um, a, a, for having zero carbon houses, a very high standard of environmental, um, uh, env environmental um, uh, cladding and so on um, for uh, within um, Henley itself. Um, Claudia um, has also uh, sent us around, I'm sure she'll talk more about this, uh, a very, very interesting link, um, YouTube link, of some houses that were built quite recently in Wales, an entire estate built to the highest carbon standards. I'm sure Claudia will talk more about that. I mean, suffice to say that these things are perfectly possible. Um, the issue that we have is getting builders to build at what is higher than the current building standards. And I think that that is what we want to really work on, how we can do that, and which is why the neighborhood plan is important. Um, we've been busily advertising um, the Green Homes Grant, which is the government grant that um, gives that will pay for most of the retrofit of your house. Um, there's quite a lot of money behind it. Um, unfortunately, I think it's been brought in rather quickly in the sense that um, quite, I know that they are they, you have to have um, a trust mark to be able to participate in the scheme if you are going to be a contractor to put in some of these some of these measures. Unfortunately, I think some of these are maybe not, they're not quite ready. Um, that it's still worthwhile, I think, um, advertising this to residents as widely as possible. And we've been doing this via Facebook. Um, and also uh, we had a market, we had a store in the market or a store in marketplace recently. Um, and we've just been putting notes through doors as well to try to encourage residents to take that grant up. So Claudia, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, so I've been looking at um, um, energy efficiency standards of existing buildings and new build and uh, done a little bit of research. So in order to build a new house that is that has hardly any carbon emissions, say, you'd be looking at a, roughly £20,000 over and above the usual building price. Now, this is anecdotal evidence, and I'd like to collect a little bit more uh, data on it, but this is the initial data that we've got. To look at an existing house, you are talking much higher numbers, more in the region of £40,000 to £70,000. So it makes sense for us to, uh, in any case, look at new build, in Henley, what we can do to influence the energy standards there um, and um, make sure that that is done before the houses get built rather than having to even retrofit the newest houses in Henley. With regard to retrofit, it makes sense financially to do this with larger numbers in one go, because otherwise you'll be looking at the 75,000 end of the scale rather than the 40,000 pounds end of the scale. So you'd be looking at whole streets where there's uh, uniform houses and the way that you would conduct a deep retrofit is to tackle the entire house in one go with prefabricated panels where um, there are there is spacing, uh, uh, manufactured in advance for the piping, for any mechanical, mechanical heat ventilation, for any um, uh, heating uh, pipes and so on. Um, the, the way this happens elsewhere is usually uh, in social housing. The advantage of that is that you only deal with the one customer, which is the social housing landlord, rather than having to deal with every single householder in one street. So this is an avenue that we'd like to explore. And um, I think as we gather more information on it for Henley specifically, we'll keep updating you. It would be really good if we could have a small pilot of say 10 to 15 homes, which would involve the local authority where we could um, maybe get some, uh, some, we'd have to get some grants. I'm not sure how we would do that. I'll look, I'll look into that. And where we can have a, like a demonstration project um, 
that is viable, that is financially viable, that the houses perform according uh, to the energy efficiency standard that it should have, and then perhaps uh, in the later term, roll it out um, across um, larger numbers of, of homes. So that would be our ideal scenario, I, I, I should think. Uh, Claudia has done a, a very useful paper, which I'm working on with her, um, which we can present to the planning committee talking about what we can do about new builds and also what we could think about in terms of the uh, position on uh, existing buildings. Um, it will be a challenge and I think, frankly, it's, we've got to do something and make a call for action for the planning committee to take a, a role in this respect, but we'll get that if, probably but in the next few weeks. Um, Patrick, before we go on to trees, is there anything else you want to pick up on um, retrofit? Patrick, I can't hear you. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, picking up on Claudia's, uh, the, the YouTube video, um, it relates to uh, a business down in South Wales, Sarrow Homes, and they've been working with the local social provider, Pobble, who are based, they're based in Newport, but they work across the whole of South Wales. Um, they do have some advanced, well, first of all, I think the cost range is actually 10 to 20K on the new build, a three, three bedroom, four bedroom house. Uh, so an extra 10K for a zero carbon three bedroom house is a worthwhile thing. It's a worthwhile investment, considering that you could end up with zero energy bills from then on in. Uh, so £2,000 a year return on a, a, a 10,000 investment sounds you know, pretty good. Um, the, the, the important things that link up with Pobble, they've got the benefit in South Wales, you could say, of having significantly, significantly more social homes than we have. And they're looking at, I can't remember, is it 5,000 homes in Swansea at the moment as a project, a conversion. But what we, we have got a, an opportunity to tap into their experience. I think we have a contact there and I think we can use that uh, to help to guide us. Because for instance, on the project the YouTube video is about, uh, which is close to Cardiff uh, in the valleys, um, they were actually, um, they were working with Western Power as uh, one of the partners. And I think that that's the sort of thing that we need to learn about is how we can tie in the energy provider as well as uh, possibly a uh, social housing provider. Okay. I think that's all for me. Thanks Patrick, do you want to touch on trees? You did a paper for the meeting yesterday. Right. It's been circulated, so perhaps you can just yes. talk that through. So um, I'm uh, I, I, uh, going on to trees. I um, We've started sort of small, I guess we've, we've done better this year. Uh, the total trees last year was 500. The trees we've planted 500 so far in Henley itself this year, and there's a chance for another thousand in Medmenham, which is uh, in Buckinghamshire. Um, and there's a possibility also for another two to three hundred in Henley. So we're still only talking about four to five percent of the trees that we would need to plant to meet the objectives that I related to this group some months ago, which is to try and sequester 10% of our carbon. Um, currently, the, all the trees in the UK are sequestering about four to 5% of our total carbon. And relating that to what we're aiming at, the 7.1 tons per person per annum, it's about 8%. So, uh, so this, that's the, what the existing trees are doing. So by doubling tree cover, which is the objective that I set, and um, which is actually an objective that Friends of the Earth are doing nationwide, um, we could actually sequester about 8% of that target of 7.1 tonnes per person per annum. So it's a significant, a significant factor. Uh, and I'd say that what we're looking for is land. We're looking for land in the district 
and we're looking for roughly 500 acres a year. So that's our challenge, is how do we find 500 acres of land a year that we can plant uh, to meet these objectives? Um, we, don't, we don't have to buy it, but we do have to persuade the landowner or the occupier, the, the tenant, to, to, to uh, go with us on this and to plant these trees. I think that probably sums up where we are now. Well, except that in the discussion yesterday, we were talking about how do we start planning. And you you made the point that the post-Brexit land stewardship um, yeah. regulation so, change, and perhaps we need to talk to NFU and yeah. country landowners. Yeah, there's so, so, so there's two things going on. Where, first of all, there's a mapping project that Friends of the Earth are running. And I've actually got maps now of the of Henley and the three local parishes that show tree opportunities where we could potentially plant trees. But it's then converting that into action. And that's where talking to local landowners through associations like the NFU uh, and the Country Landowners Association, and also actually through personal contact, as I've discovered that is the most effective way to do it. So what I think we need to do is to start networking. And I noticed Ken's gone out of the room. So there's a plug here for Ken, when is is because he's the one that's best networked, I think, in terms of landowners, um, is is to uh, is to try and find out what contacts we already have. Uh, to... Patrick, should we wait until he comes back if you're gonna plug it? Well, I, 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 I'll, I'll plug it again. Yes, we've heard this. We heard it yesterday. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. I, 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 I'll. Uh, when Ke when Ken comes back, I'll just say my piece then, uh, if that's all right, Tony. Okay. Sure. Naomi, this may be an area where you can support us. We're not ready to talk about it in detail yet, but certainly, in terms of uh, publicising and communicating, as well as uh, personal approaches, there may be something we can do on a broader basis. Um, Let's move on then. Thank you for that, Patrick. Let's move on to electrical vehicle charging points. And uh, Fiona, can you update where the council is at on electric vehicle charging points? And I'll come back to it again later. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Tony. Um, so, uh, electric vehicle charging points has been a high priority project for the council um, because it's known that changing from petrol. Um, diesel vehicles to or battery vehicles reduce your carbon footprint about, by about two tonnes of carbon dioxide a year. So, it's a significant contribution to individual carbon footprints. Um, and also government policy is to ban the sale. Paul? Paul's hand up. Are you having problems hearing it? Yeah, I am. It sounds as though somebody from. from Police academy is on the on the line. I, I can hear that echo as well. It's really distracting. Uh, I think it. I think it might actually be Tony. Um, so, if, if Tony wants to mute uh, while other people are speaking, that yeah. might solve the problem. Yeah, sure. Okay, let's try that. Paul, it, that's better. I'm getting the thumbs up from Paul. That's better, and that sounds better for me. So. Thank you very much, Sheridan. That's that's helpful. So uh, this the second point as to why electric vehicle charging points has been a high priority um, for the Climate Emergency Working Group is the, the government policy to ban the sale of petrol and diesel vehicles. Um, and they're talking about a date possibly as early as 2030, and that may also include hybrid vehicles as well. So the time scale for this it's really quite tight under which Henley and another else uh, in England would, would need um, a network of electric vehicle uh, charging points. So you may recall um, that uh, earlier this year, um, the council commissioned um, a feasibility study of council owned sites to find out where there was the possibility for electric vehicle charging points. Um, that study identified three possible points, um, and that was by a company called Joju, and they've now come forward with um, three sites that I'm doing some further work on. It's throwing up quite a lot of detailed questions, 
um, which I had hoped to have resolved in time for the next finance and strategy uh, meeting, management meeting on the, uh, the 10th of November, but I don't think I'm going to quite make that meeting. I think we'll have to use a later meeting, I'm afraid, Sheridan, as you, you accurately predicted when I ambitiously said I would try and do this. Um, there's just some detail points around leasing arrangements and car parking charges that I need to present clearly um, to the council before I feel I can put that um, to, to the committee um, for decision. Um, I'm just checking whether there's any other points I need to make. So the um, Joji are proposing a supplier funded installation and maintenance project, so they would pay all the costs. They can implement it in a phased installation. So if there were some sites that were uh, more difficult than others, or perhaps took a bit longer to resolve some of the issues, they could do that in phases. But the whole plan is for a total of 12 charging points as the first step, a pilot project, um, if you will, on um, council-owned sites. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions on that if there's anything anyone else needs to know. Go on up. Yeah, um, Tesco's have put their charging points. Was that on the list? That area, because we don't need to, because they've already installed charging points there. Yeah. Um, well, the research I've done suggests that I, I'm only looking at, at um, council sites. Right. Um, I thought we found that, so, but it's fine. So, no, it's fine. Um, but there are only there are only six um, other other sites in the whole of the RG9 postcode for electric vehicle charging at the moment. Right. Okay. Rebecca. Are, are, are we looking at these because of the problem with um, OCC? So OCC can't stop us doing these because they're in council-owned land. Is that the point? That, that's right. These are all uh, uh, Henley Town Council-owned sites. Okay. So these are ones that we can push ahead with without having to wait for OCC or SODC to resolve um, their, their strategy issues. But there are some consistency issues I need to check around car park charging and that kind of thing. OK, I think, I think that's a good idea because uh, that, that means we've got the initiative then, doesn't it? So. Jackie. I, I just wanted to check that the council owned land, we're not waiting for the county council. Is it for the curbside electric vehicle charging that we're waiting for the county council to decide their county wide strategy? Is that right? Yes, uh, it is. Okay. I, I was at the Bixon Assenden Parish Council last night and I asked the county councillor, David Bartholomew, what he knew. Of, of the County Council deciding this strategy and where they were at in the process. Um, he actually didn't know very much about it, but he's logged the query and um, I hope that he might come back to me, but if not, I've at least asked verbally and I can, I can chase him up later. Thanks. Is, is there anything that Henley Town Council could help in trying to... Um find out exactly where they are in the process. Kath, Fiona. Yeah, yes, you... um, 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 certainly, I mean, we can, we can ask, um, our councillors can do that. Um, for those who are district councillors and county councillors as well can do that through meetings or, or we can contact the officers. I'm um, checking through the history of the recent, you know, emails from from my predecessor as well. There's um, there's been quite a lot of inquiries to um, to the county council and the district council already. We can certainly keep doing that, but it's not obvious that yeah. their approach to this will change very quickly. No, I mean, the, the reason behind my question is that we, I, since I've joined the climate emerging working group i've always heard this as, a, as a, an issue but i haven't heard how the issue is being progressed and is it indeed progressing 
It does worry me when Jackie gets that response from a from a district councillor that whether or not it's actually on their radar and it is a priority. It'd be great to, to know that it is. Kath and I and Fiona discussed this yesterday after the meeting. Um, and I think there's a need to come to, uh, to request OCC to give us an update. They have been singularly ineffective in communicating to us. And I think we need some, some heavyweight hitting. So uh, we need to move on that. Kath? Um, I'd just like to say that, you know, the County Councillor for Henley, Stefan Gavashak, he's been pushing this with OCC as well. Um, looking back through the email trails as we were after our chat yesterday, you know, you can see it's been consistent um, for, for months, you know, over the last year, really. Um, it's just that it seems to keep slipping down OCC's priority list, but it's definitely something we can push from the officer side as well as getting the councillors involved to chase that up with OCC. It's, it's just they um, often seem to have other priorities. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Kath. Um, Rebecca, would you oh, like sorry, to... Sorry, is there something else we need to raise under this? I'll mm -hmm. raise it under the priorities. Okay. Yeah. Rebecca, would you like to pick up the update on Silver Streets, please? Um, so Silver Streets, we have had um, 12 installations um, and there are 28 surveys outstanding. Um, obviously the conversion rate from surveys to or from um, leads to actual installations has been disappointing. Unfortunately that's almost certainly just due to COVID. Um, so the numbers that we've got um, are less than we would have hoped but um, in the circumstances maybe not surprising. Um, the good news is that um, they have been so successful with Solar Streets as a whole that um, IDEA have now opened an office in High Wycombe um, because they now have a Solar Streets scheme in St Albans and by from from contacts that we made for them, um, there's one in Tame which is being rolled out as we speak, um, one in Marlow that's going to start next year, um, and one in Farringdon. I went over to see the mayor um, and the deputy D chief clerk a few weeks ago, um, and they've been in contact with Idea to start their own solar street scheme. So that's good. So it's spreading to other towns. But the, the good news about there being an office in High Wycombe is that they're not so constrained to just having this done in phases. Um, they could be they could do uh, smaller numbers because people are not coming so far. Um, this morning I've been out putting a few leaflets indoors about solar streets, so hopefully we'll be able to um, pick up a few more as well for Henley. Um, so that's where we are. Um, we don't really, as a scheme now, we don't really need to have an awful lot more involvement with it from this group. Um, it'll run itself now. Um, Andy, Tunstall and Idea will just get on with it now. So I think as long as we keep a watching brief on it, we don't actually need to get that much more involved, which is good. Thank you, Rebecca. I appreciate that. Um, Sheridan, would you like to talk about the public sector decarbonisation scheme that you're running for the council? Indeed, yes. Um, so this was some information that um, Tony kindly sent on. It was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so it's a new uh, initiative from central government, um, and the idea is that um, it's a, a pot of funding to 100% uh, fund uh, improvements to public sector buildings uh, to reduce costs on, uh, on heating the building, whether or not that is uh, adaptations to the building, so insulation, draft exclusion, that sort of thing, uh, or um, uh, in installation of systems heat pumps or air source heat pumps. Um, the deadline, as with a lot of these schemes, uh, is very last minute. Uh, so uh, if you wanted to apply, you needed to get your application in by the beginning of December. Uh, with that in mind, uh, uh, we didn't really think that we had the resources in-house to be able to get all the information together ready to put together a grant application uh, for beginning December. Uh, however, I spoke to a consultant I've worked with before called uh, Avico, they used to be called Carbon Smart, um, and uh, basically they, uh, uh, I've um, asked them to basically help uh, do the initial scoping of the project uh, and to um, put together a grant application 
for, so there are two pots of, of, of grant funding. Uh, one is basically to pay for the uh, manpower to, uh, to do the feasibility studies and to project manage it. And the other is to actually pay for uh, the installation of, of uh, whatever, um, uh, whatever schemes uh, might arise from that. Um, so uh, they're going to put together a, a grant application uh, for their own fees to project manage uh, this. Um, and uh, with a view to putting together a full application uh, for um, funding for, uh, for several buildings that the, that the council owns to look at uh, what we can do to reduce our heating costs uh, there. So the four buildings in question, it has to be a building uh, which not only the council owns, but the council pays uh, for the utilities, uh, which, uh, which limits us down to the town hall, uh, old fire station, King's Arms Barn, and the pavilion at Mill Meadows. Um, so uh, they are onto that now. Uh, we should have the grant application in, I think it's by the 5th of December. And then we should hear five days after that, whether or not we've been uh, successful for, uh, for uh, basically paying for their fees for a full feasibility study. If we are successful, they would then undertake that feasibility uh, study um, and then make a full application for, uh, for the costs of um, uh, the actual projects to, uh, uh, to uh, install any of the systems that, that we decide to, to go with. So it's all a little bit uh, last, last minute, basically. Um, but that's where we are with that. Thank you, Sheridan. Any questions? I can see Joseph has a question. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure how much you can share, but obviously there are other organisations within Henley that are sort of very interested in these kind of schemes. Um, are you able to share what the costs of those sort of feasibility studies are? Uh, so the uh, not for the full feasibility study. We've uh, so we've only commissioned them to undertake the initial kind of scoping study, basically to put in, together enough information to make the grant applications. Um, and uh, they were initially going to charge twelve hundred. Uh, we managed to uh, to get them down to uh, eight hundred uh, plus four hundred pounds if they're successful with the grant application. Uh, so obviously there's there's a, a bit of an incentive in there uh, for them. Is, is that a, a desktop study? Is that a day rate? I mean, what's the basis? Yeah, so that's a desktop desktop study based on uh, on a uh, on a uh, based on two days work. Great, thank you. Questions of Sheridan. Okay, one thing I'd like to ask Sheridan: when you get the first stage successfully completed. It would be nice to communicate that out to the community about what has been happening and the, the direction that the council is taking. So I hope that's agreeable to you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's then go on to communication to residents. Sorry, any other questions? Claudia? Um, I've not heard of this company before. I mean, would it be worth one of us looking through uh, whichever the proposal is, just to sort of, I don't know, double, double check? That's Claudia, it's Carbon Smart. You would probably know Carbon Smart as it used to be called. Do you know, I'd quite, I, I, would, I would be quite interested to see it because I don't know what, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I could echo that, Claudia, and I think I can see Sheridan's got a finger up, she's going to come in a minute, but there are there are other entities, public buildings that are doing very similar things within Henley, so it'd be very interesting if there are learnings from this exercise that we can transfer to other projects that we're also looking at as part of the Climate Emergency Working Group. That would be very useful knowledge share. Sheridan, may I share the paper you sent me? Um, yes, you're, you're more than welcome to share the, the paper I sent you. Uh, just to confirm, so I, I did run past a couple of members of the working group um, uh, as well for their, for their thoughts. Uh, with tight timelines, it's uh, obviously that we couldn't have brought it to this meeting. Uh, but also, I have worked uh, on them. It was for an RCEF um, uh, project at a previous council, uh, which was uh, uh, fully funded and really, really successful. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions? No? 
Sure, and thank you for your contribution. Appreciate that. I guess, Tony, just, just could we get confirmation that we can share the output from these studies? You mean the third group? parties? Could, could we get the knowledge share from that? I think Sharon is saying yes. Yes. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'd like now to go on to the communication to residents. We reviewed a very much draft paper yesterday, which I'm going to share with you. Um, it's about how do we get, get residents to take responsibility for their own um, personal carbon footprint. And, uh, and that's the wrong one, sorry. Um, this is it. So you can see that it's a, a very much a draft. It'll need tightening up. Um, it splits the activities between no cost or lower cost, and then goes on to um, medium cost, and then to higher cost, and then to behavioral change. Um, it seems that we've got to make residents aware of the fact that they have a responsibility to take um, actions about their own carbon footprint as part of the contribution that the council and the businesses in Henley are taking. So we reviewed this yesterday. Um, I'm happy to share this with all the members of the working group today, um, but, and that should be he Henley, not Healy. Um, it's, our intention is that once it's finalized, at least in terms of text, it should go on the website of the Climate Emergency Working Group. And also we should use it as part of social media. So I don't want to go any more on that. As I said, I'll, I'll circulate it to you all. I'll close this down now. Um, but Naomi, this is something that uh, we'd like you to participate with Rebecca and Fiona and Jackie in terms of how it can be communicated, how it can be made a lot more um, attractive and also how it can be used in social media. Absolutely. Very, very much so. Happy to. Okay. Any thoughts on, on, on it? in terms of the approach, anything you want to share? Some um, best practice had been shared earlier in the week, I believe from Chinner. Um, I think we can learn from that. There are a few other examples online, but uh, I can come back to you separately. Uh, it looks fairly concise. So just from a first glance there now, but I'm sure we can further refine. I have asked all the members of the, the group that met yesterday, if they've got any additions to let us have it. and. Uh, Bring them all together. So um, I'll circulate it as a draft so you can have a look at it, okay? Marvellous. Um, what I'd like to do, sorry Paul, go ahead. Yeah, it's just a question. Um, we talked about social media. What, what about the other um, avenues we could pursue, such as uh, local newspapers and so forth? Yeah, we'll do that as well. And one of the things we're thinking about is whether you can have something like a tip of the week or something like that, you know? Um, and use that for publication as well to give them a full story. Uh, Donna, sorry. Because I was trying to read that because I haven't read it. And it's really good, actually, because one of my big bugbears is people leaving things on standby because it's just pure laziness. But they actually save money. They'd save money if they switched their, their, their stuff off, you know. And it's incentives like that. Also, I've noticed, I don't know if it's anybody else has, Right, but if you walk to town and back, and if you did that twice a day, you'd get your 10,000 step count. So if people want to get their step count up and be more green-minded, it works for that. So it's just little things like that that we could be encouraging people to do. Because I think it's more carrot rather than stick. Yeah. Approach. If we encourage people rather than preaching, I think it works better. So, yeah. Okay. Well, could you contribute as well? If you see any, any yeah. comments, Paul, yeah. again? Yeah, just following up on the comments about uh, other media and newspapers. Obviously, newspapers are meant to be independent, I guess, um, or maybe not. <laughs> um, what influence does, does uh, Henley Town Council have on our local um, publishing organisations? Or, um, or do you keep out of it? Um, any comments from the officers? So, oh, well, for example, they they always they receive all of the agenda and papers 
for this meeting. So um, both both the Henley newspapers um, get all that information as a as a matter of matter of routine. Kenneth, Tony, um, yeah, I I think the um, I think the councils have a pretty good. Uh, um, relationship with the both the Henley Standard and the uh, Henley Herald, the online paper. You know they're always looking for editorial. So as much as you can give them, they will definitely print it. It's as simple as that. Uh, as I say, it fills up space for them. And normally, if you just send out what you want to go in there, sometimes they just put it straight in there because it saves them obviously doing them doing some work. So. You know, whatever you want, just just get in touch with any of the uh, the reporters, and they may even phone you back to get more informa information out of it. But um, you know, I think we've got a pretty good relationship with them. You know, there's always you know bits and pieces in the paper that come from council meetings, and as I say, it fills up the the columns for them as well. <coughs> Ian, <coughs> I wonder if it's worth considering. Uh... Uh, going through schools, everyone knows that your children are children are tremendous nags, mm. and uh, if they're aware of this uh, this list of things that can be done, uh, easy, medium, and hard, uh, and they're encouraged, they put their parents to uh, to tick off the list. And if we issue some sort of uh, uh, qualification or get them to fill in a qualification, I'm thinking of the uh, uh, of the NHS Rainbow that a lot of children did outside their homes. Uh, in the earlier stages of lockdown. If we could uh, just encourage parents, uh, children to have a go at their parents and tick off the list and then uh, uh, perhaps have a, uh, uh, an indication outside their house, yeah, we're a, we're a bronze level uh, climate emergency household. <laughs> uh, in, and of course, yeah, going through schools is quite an effective way of getting uh, to as many people uh, you know, in the town as possible, I, both directly to, to children. Uh, but also to their parents. Donna, you have a comment? Yes, yeah, we did that with the No Idling campaign. We went around schools and it was fantastic. It was great, you know, it was a great initiative and more parents by driving and driving. We had that snakes and ladder board, great big thing, and all the kids loved it. They thought it was great. That could be something. So, yeah. Sorry, Paul. I was just going to add to that, um, as part of um, Patrick, myself, and Jackie, as part of Greener Henley, we're we do we're having quite a, we have a strategy of working with the school, so we can certainly uh, include it in that, and we have a meeting, uh, open meeting this evening, Greener Henley, for those who are interested in joining. Rebecca. Um, I, I mean, I would just like to add my support to that. I think schools are a really, really good place to go. Um, my own, my husband's um, niece came home after a climate change talk at school and persuaded her whole family to go vegetarian. So, so you know, it, it definitely does work. Um, Paul, I know that um, Greener Henley had Climate Warriors, which I believe was a schools thing that you were that, that Greener Henley ran. Uh, I'm relatively new, so I'm, I'm, uh, I was unaware of that, but maybe perhaps Patrick or Jackie could talk to that. That was by Katrina Judge. Yeah. Patrick, you probably didn't... Yeah, that's, that's all I was going to say, is Katrina's been running that one. And I believe it's been successful. It's been very successful. Uh, the, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the schools don't take it up. Yeah. The, the, the one thing I'd say at the moment, uh, my, my contacts with schools recently have been somewhat strained because they just don't have the resources all the time at the moment with the current lockdown and the issues that they've been facing. Uh, that's no reason why we shouldn't prepare and plan to do it. It's just to be ready to be pushed back at the moment simply because they aren't able to take on anything more. And that was... That was including Gillets. That was the the answer I got back from Gillets recently on an initiative. They they just haven't got the the the, the spare resources to deal with anything new. Yeah, fine point, Rebecca. Um, Patrick, I was going to ask you. I mean, I I don't I don't know the content of the Climate Warriors program, but it would seem to me um, that there would certainly be opportunities for developing 
a kind of fun set of activities that lasted an hour or two or something that you could do in schools around climate and climate change. But is this what the Climate Warriors programme already does? I think Climate Warriors is more of a campaigning organisation, uh, which is always much more fun than actually having to give up something. Uh, but there's uh, no reason for not having a discussion with Katrina. I mean, that's the, we'll I'll pick that up. Yeah. Good point. I think we should uh, see what she's doing and perhaps learn from it. I also think there's a need for, in terms of this communication to residents, we ought to be linked in with whatever Green Henley is doing as well. So it isn't just a, a council. It needs to be seen as being coming from two fronts, I think. Um, let me move on then, if you're happy, to the next item agenda, which is the paper, which is at page 13 to about page 14, I think, which is the impact of the working group's actions on the heart carbon footprint. Um, I'll talk it through. Um, I'm happy to put it on the screen, but actually probably it's easy to talk, easy to talk it through. Um, we started at the beginning of last July 2019, looking at the carbon footprint using the government's local authority data um, and use that as a basis of saying, what could we do? Um, the impact of the actions I, I've identified in terms of what is the carbon footprint that we've saved, um, the carbon emissions rather, and so, so the streets is about 13 tonnes so far per annum. The, uh, the sites that we've been looking at with both Chilton Hills and Reading Community Energy is about uh, 251 tonnes. And then we went on talking about electric vehicle charging points. Um, so the first two schemes, Solar Streets and Children Hills, will have an impact because it's demonstrating that the council and the working group is trying to do things. Um, but it still needs to get more communications of what the uh, residents can do as such. So that the communication, the, the, the schemes in itself to date have a communications value. When we started this, we looked at what else we could do in terms of um, other actions. And we talked about other renewables, including a wind turbine, including um, hydro schemes and so forth. We'll still be looking at this. Um, they are expensive, but they're important. Um, we looked also at retrofit, which I had then the Reading Borough Council's estimate for retrofit, which came in about 35,000 a year. And then also we talked about mitigation using uh, tree planting, which uh, Patrick has already referred to. What is important is the proposed end of sales of petrol and diesel cars, new petrol and diesel cars, which the government started talking about 2040, then they moved it back down to 2035, they're now talking about 2030. Um, and if you look at the calculations of how many cars are likely to be in Henley. And if you're able to substitute all of those with battery cars, then you're gonna get a saving in emissions of about 11,000 tonnes, um, or about 15% of the, the total footprint. We then also talked in paper about uh, decarbonisation. And the key issue there is not really the, the council's own decarbonisation, but it's domestic gas decarbonisation that's used in our resident houses. Um, so I then came up with a suggested list of priorities, um, clearly continue with what we're doing on Solar Streets and Children Hills, but actually also publish our achievements much more um, to, so that we can have at the same time advice to residents about what they can do to reduce their own carbon footprint. That's what you've got in that communication. Um, have plans in place for, tar for tree planting so we can take advantage of the countryside stewardship scheme so that we're in advance of whatever might happen uh, post-Brexit. Um, apply to R Rural Community Energy Fund for grants for feasibility studies on some of the larger renewable technology projects. And then attempt to influence planning regulation to avoid new build schemes that are not passive builds. So actually be proactive in that context. And then lastly, um, survey Henley Streets now to identify where on street charging points are required and plan to possibly avoid a disastrous outcome for the council in 2030 if we haven't actually put the infrastructure in 
and residents want to actually uh, replace their petrol or diesel fuel cars with new pure battery cars. And then also think about what we can do in a similar manner to solar streets to develop a car decarbonisation scheme for residential homes. Um, those are the priorities. We discussed those yesterday. Are there any questions or any comments on what's in that paper and also the priorities? Okay. So I would propose there what we do is take those priorities and start developing action plans behind them. Is that all right for everyone? Yeah. Okay. So let's move on then to the next item in the agenda, which, sorry. Sorry, Tony, before we, we skip on, um, could I just raise a point about um, electric vehicle charging points? Because SODC have a parking consultation um, at the moment. And so there might be an opportunity to raise some of these issues um, with them through their, through their parking consultation. So I wondered if, uh, if, if this group wanted to, to consider making a response to the... You sent that parking consultation through to us yesterday, didn't you? Yes, I did, yes. Um, are all the councillors aware of it? It was only sent happen. yesterday. They may not have a chance, have had a chance to see it unless they've, of course, come across it in other, in other ways. Could, could you circulate it to the councillors so they're aware of it, please? I think I think it went to everybody yesterday, okay. um, but it, I'll I'll check that. Kath, sorry. Yeah, I think it went out to councillors last week. It's been extensively um, highlighted on social media as well. So we don't need to do anything else in terms of other than just looking at it. Well, I think the the there question is. came up yesterday as to whether there was a Henley Town Council submission that should be made to that. Uh, consultation aside from us as individuals also making um, a submission yeah. I, I was I was wondering yesterday if the climate emergency working group would a, a reply a submission as, as a group okay I'm happy to do that um, can you look at the consultation and come back with some comments so we can formulate a response Fiona, when is the deadline for a response? You're on mute. Sorry, thank you. Uh, from memory, I think the 18th of November. <clears throat> yeah, I've got you here. Could we get a response from those that have a chance to look at the consultation by, say, this time next week? Okay. All right. Um, can we then move to the budget? which is on the back page of your papers. Fiona, would you like to talk it through? Sure. So, um, Henley Town Council is uh, at the start of its budget round um, for the next municipal year, so starting in April um, 2021. And I've put together um, some suggestions with advice from, from Tony on what what this group might like to ask the council to to put in its budget um, and that will help structure our plans and make sure the funds are in place for the important projects that we've got planned um, throughout the year. So as you can see um, I've, I've put together um, a proposal um, for a total request of um, £14,700 for, um, for the next financial year. Uh, one concern I have about the draft as we have it at the moment um, is there's nothing in there to support the solar streets um, project aside from funding for public um, engagement uh, work. So um, I'm not sure whether, um, whether that's, that's sufficient or or um, whether any further consideration needs to be uh, given to that. Um, the other point to make is in the notes at the bottom there, you'll see that um, there, there are other potential sources of funding through, for example, the community infrastructure levy. So it is possible um, if um, 
the uh, council committees um, approve the suggestion to request funds from these other sources also. Um, Rebecca, are there any more costs likely for Solar Streets? I would have thought that's probably... No, I, I, no, I, I, think it, I, I think it's completely fine to have nothing apart from just um, some promotion with, with posts and so on, because um, it's mostly self-funding now. Could I just highlight two things then in this? And there's the first two um, rows. One, uh, we're talking a moment about the, the sites we're looking at in Chiltern Hills, um, but including that with schools, and we intend to offer them free energy audits, as well as grants for energy efficiency improvements from those audits. Um, and I think that is something we should continue. In other words, there's going to be community buildings that have a need for more energy efficiency. And I think we should be able to make grants on a match fund basis, as it says. So that's an important aspect. That we're able to help people, help community buildings, rather than just um, advise on what they should be doing. Paul. Just carry on, it's a question for the, for the end, okay. Um, or do you want to ask it now? Paul, so what did you say? It was a question for the end. I was just, um, you carry on and then if you can come to me at the end, that'd be great. Okay. The end of the budget. Okay, sorry, I didn't understand that. Okay, all right. Um, just quickly, Patrick, when you get a chance, could you write to Ken about the tree? Because he seems to disappear as far as I can tell. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll um, do that. Could I raise a question about budget for trees? Yeah. Um, I think that it's uh, developing a tree strategy for the town council is, is critical. And Fiona uh, mentioned that, and we talked about that a bit at our meeting yesterday. Um, I wonder whether we need to budget to deliver that strategy for the first year. There may be some planting costs and so on, uh, possibly some consultancy uh, that, that would be needed to actually deliver the first stage of the strategy uh, uh, through next year. Yeah, and you've just covered my question, Patrick, so thank you. <laughs> Do, I think if Fiona's going to be able to answer it, she needs some indication of what it might cost well, um, and how it might actually be implemented. There, there we have a problem because uh, this has got to go to uh, various committees uh, to develop. You know, we're not going to develop a tree strategy for the town council. We're going to make proposals to other committees as to what we would like to see, but they've got to work on their, their, their what sort of... Uh, the, the various uh, aspects of it, such as which trees need replacing, which ones they're going to want, where they're going to want to extend planting, and so on and so on. That, but we, so we're we're kind of it's a bit of a wet finger in the air at the moment. To uh, you know, perhaps putting a thousand pounds aside for the first year's delivery, uh, that, that that might be sufficient. Um, but it it's just it would be a shame to deliver to develop a strategy, and then be stuck. Um, because we haven't got any way of delivering it. Um, and then that so said, I wonder whether this is an opportunity to spend SIL money, uh, that, that, that whether we would be able to, having developed uh, through the Town Council a tree strategy, to find funding from SIL to help to deliver the first year of it. So that's kind of a question for Sheridan, for Kath, and for Fiona, really. Patrick, could we perhaps take it a bit more positive than that and say that what we should be doing is making a recommendation of what they should be looking at? Yep. And then allow them to get on with it. Ian, sorry, you had a question. Well, I was going to try and help uh, help, help guide people about the budget setting process and how, how we should be regarding that. The, 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 the budget has to be uh, approved on January the 5th or, um, or no later than January the 5th. And we're we're in the town, town council is in the process of, of drawing up through the various committees and subcommittees and so on it, its plan for uh, uh, for the 21, 2021 2022 uh, spending and and 
that's all it is. It's a plan. So if there's the intention of this group to uh, uh, to be prepared to spend money on a, a tree planting uh, uh, campaign, then uh, then it would make perfectly good sense to put that in now. It doesn't represent a a commitment or a uh, or, or an undertaking uh, or, or a decision even. Uh, it just says it just helps the, the town council to look at its likely spending for the whole of the year and look to see whether or not uh, uh, the budget as a whole adds up. So so please do put it in if you think it's likely. So I, I, I'd strongly recommend doing that. And of course, when it comes to what, uh, spending on SIL or not, uh, the budget is the spending plan. And wherever possible, we're likely to try and uh, spend money using SIL because uh, you know, that's capital that uh, we, we've been assigned for, uh, uh, for, for development of the, uh, of the town's infrastructure. Uh, and, and if we don't spend it within five years, it gets lost. So we, we need to make sure we do spend it wherever we can. But where it, where it actually comes from in the, uh, uh, with it, in the town council uh, finances, uh, needn't really worry us here. We'll, 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 we'll take it from where we need to if we decide it's something we want to do. So I, I hope that helps. That, that helps a great deal. Uh, so Fiona, could I ask that we put £2,000 aside for the, the objective, the, the target we've set is a thousand, a thousand trees in Henley, in the parish. Uh, those can be on town council land. Where possible, that would be quite a good thing because there's not much other land, as I mentioned in the email to you. Um, there's very little land that isn't tied up by developers. Uh, so, so if we could put two thousand pounds aside, that would help. So, do you want me to add a line on tree strategy delivery? You've got tree yeah. strategy development and add two thousand pounds for street tree strategy delivery. Delivery. Is that correct? Yes, please. Sure. Um, I, I just wanted to, um, um, oh, thank you, I uh, was just getting some feedback. I just wanted to clarify um, about the, the uh, uh, about how it works with the tree strategy. So um, obviously this group is responsible for creating a tree strategy for, for the town as a whole. Um, and, obviously, and the town council will have its own uh, tree management policy. Uh, which are which are two different things. So your strategy will cover the whole of the town, of which, as Patrick was saying, a lot of the available land will be town council land. But separately, um, the town council uh, is responsible for looking after its 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 tree stocks uh, and developing them, and that's something that a separate team uh, is responsible for and, and and looks after and has budget to do uh, uh, to to do so. In fact, for the coming year, I believe the recommended budget is 30,000 uh, for that. So some of that work may be able to be delivered uh, in that, uh, through that uh, budget that we, have, uh, that we have there. So I think it's probably best that that is delivered through that budget. But if this, um, if this uh, group wants a separate budget to help facilitate tree, pl tree planting elsewhere, uh, then that's some, uh, certainly something that they could look to do. Okay, Patrick. Yeah, that that that. Uh, I think what would be very helpful actually is to have some liaison between the two, rather than us trying to develop two completely separate plans. Is that if if we as a group had an understanding of what the town council was planning to do, uh, it would help us to avoid duplication and also potentially help supplement uh, and support what the town council, their aspirations for their land, not dissimilar to the planting we did just a few days ago, which was on the town council land to replace felling that was take, had taken place earlier in the year. So uh, I, 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 Sheridan, uh, the question for you is, how do we enable some sort of communication so that this would be done in, in, uh, in concert rather than uh, as two completely separate exercises. Fiona first and then Claudia. Um, that, it sounds like my job to be the liaison person between, between okay. uh, this group um, and the officers. And in, on that conversation with um, Becky and, and Judith has already 
started. I would also say that they are looking to this group and to us to advise them on how, you know, tree strategy affects carbon sequestration. Yeah. Because it's not, it's not something they have, I mean, they have an awareness of it, but it's not something they have knowledge of or experience of. So there's just a slight risk of getting into a chicken and egg situation where we're waiting for them to tell us and they're waiting, yeah. you know, and we don't want to do that. So I think we should consider that we can be leaders on the issue of carbon sequestration, working obviously closely with them as policy and operational delivery. I hope that sounds right, Sheridan. Um, yes, uh, apologies. My internet uh, connection is rather unstable. So uh, if I seem to be going blank or not answering a question, uh, I'm not trying to, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not doing it deliberately. Uh, but yes, Fiona's right. Uh, Fiona has been working with uh, our parks department on this. Uh, whilst tree planting is essential, obviously looking after those trees in the long term is even more essential. Yeah. Um, and that's something that they are, that they are certainly experts on. They, they do that. Uh, they do that all the time. Uh, and with the planting, I'm sure they will be more than happy to continue working with uh, in partnership uh, with, with Fiona and this group. Claudia, you had your hand raised one stage. Um, I'm not sure whether this is the appropriate uh, time to do it, but I've got something to say about this uh, SIL money. So a few days ago, I attended online the SODC CA. CEAC meeting and there was quite a lot of discussion about SIL money and because I'm relatively new I didn't really understand it but I did understand the following so Sue Roberts basically said with regard to SIL money of which there seems to be quite a lot that they're looking to spend is the impression I got uh, she said we want to work closely with local neighborhoods and distribute this money to them uh, and to community groups like parishes and uh, climate action groups so that objectives for nature and climate can be achieved. Um, which they would be considering access to funds uh, to do that, keep up with rec nature recovery networks, but also looking at setting up a retrofit unit within uh, councils in accordance with, with SIL. Um, I, and I think they want to put this as an agenda item on the next agenda. Now, I don't know how it all works with who influences who, but my question would be, given that they've said this, what would be for us the best way to now tap into it and tell them how we'd like to spend it and so on? Claudia, can you perhaps circulate that document so we can look at it and be able to comment on it with some considered approaches. I'm assuming I probably need to wait for formal uh, notes of that meeting. Okay. But I'll look out for those, shall I? Okay. Yeah. Um, right. What I'd like to now, sorry, Sheridan. Sorry, uh, just a very quick clarification. On SIL, um, uh, apologies if, if you already know this. So SIL is a bit more complicated. So uh, there's, a, uh, there's a portion of SIL uh, which is given to town and parish councils to spend and we get 25% of SIL receipts. Um, so that is within our restriction, uh, within uh, our remit to spend that, that money within reason, within certain parameters. Um, but then the district council uh, also retain a portion of SIL uh, for themselves to use. So where we talk about uh, spending SIL, we're probably talking about our own portion. Uh, however, it does raise a good question as to whether or not we can, uh, we can uh, work together with the district council uh, to help them spend their pots as well. Patrick? Yeah, the, uh, my understanding from Sue Roberts is that uh, her terms was that SODC is awash with SIL. They've got so much of it, they don't know what to do with it. And she is trying to, uh, siphon off is the wrong word, but to allocate um, as much of it as possible for meeting her objectives, because they've said that they, they have signed up to a 2030 zero carbon uh, uh, target, and they need to do an awful lot to get there. So I think what she's trying to do is to divert SODC SIL to community groups and councils and neighborhood areas 
uh, in order to facilitate their implementing uh, zero carbon strategies. So that, that, that was my understanding from Sue. And I think that uh, as soon as you get that clarification, Claudia, I think the, you know, the, the minutes uh, uh, that the, the we should tackle Sue straight away um, because I think she's very receptive. Can, can we just take that as an action for a, a future working group meeting, yeah. Tony? I'm particularly thinking in terms of Chiltern Hills community energy as well. Yeah, I agree. Any other comments on the budget? Um, I, I wanted to finish a comment on that section, which would be to suggest we also go through uh, the, the district councillors of, of Henley, uh, one of which is Ken and this Kelly and Stefan. Good point. Thank you, Jackie. Um, so, Claudia, that first of all, the, the action there is for you to send us the minutes as soon as you get them, OK? And then we'll review them. Um, what I'd like to do now is go to item 12 on the budget, on the, on the agenda. Uh, Kath, could you close down the open uh, streaming?